our scripture reference is uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. A great portion of scripture with assurance, words of comfort, a promise that he is coming again. Let's read it together. Let, Let not, not your, your heart, heart be troubled. Be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is God's word, and this, and this is what is I what believe. I believe. <clears throat> Jesus is coming again. If you believe it, sing it with enthusiasm. People going somewhere to stand for Jesus is coming again. <clears throat> Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Forest and flower exclaim, mountain and meadow the same. coming again, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon, coming again, coming again. is coming again standing before him at last trial and trouble all past crowns at his feet we will cast Jesus is coming again coming again Ever since uh, John W. Peterson penned those words back, I believe, in the 70s, some have changed the lyrics to say, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but surely soon, instead of singing maybe, but surely soon. And, and that's what we believe. I want to begin a series uh, of messages uh, this morning, and uh, 
I think I have 11 or 12 messages in the series, so that'll take us well into the fall. But during the past several years, a term that is typically associated with the game of chess has become a media buzzword. It's a, a phrase that we hear on the nightly news and from the lips of people in business and politics. It's the word end game. Now, end game in chess is the final stage of a game. It, it usually follows the exchange of queens and a catastrophic reduction of forces. The primary objective of endgame is checkmate. When one player maneuvers his opponent's king into a checkmate from which it cannot escape. And yet recently, this term has become quite popular and it's being used to describe everything from the war in Ukraine to the outcome of the present UAW strike. In this wider sense, endgame refers to the final strategies, the final movements designed to bring about a desired conclusion. Using endgame in this wider sense, I want to apply it to the subject of Bible prophecy. You see, as only God can do, he has an endgame that has been predetermined and pre-announced. And as many have correctly observed, history, rightly understood, is his story. It is his story. Rather than a desperate, fatalistic view of the future, believers can rest assured that God is sovereignly in control of his universe. This means nothing takes God by surprise. Not hurricanes, not tsunamis, not election results, not wars, not even climate change. It means that no power in heaven or on earth can stop or even slow down what God has planned. Among other things, sovereignty means that Jesus is going to win because God has planned it to be so. The final stage of God's plan will culminate and the ultimate checkmate when Jesus Christ claims control of his creation. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24 says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. And this great event is so certain to take place, the Revelation speaks of it in the past tense as though it has already happened. Revelation 11:15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. I'm counting on this. How about you? I'm counting on this. Now, did you know that God has a unique trademark that separates him from every false god that men worship? God's trademark is his ability to see, to control, and to make known the future. No one but our sovereign creator can do this. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says that God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And as the prophecies of the Old Testament prove, God fulfills his purposes with absolute precision and pinpoint accuracy. As a witness to his ability to make known the end from the beginning, consider the miraculous preservation of Israel. Logic and human history say the Jews should not be here. They should not be here. Other nations that at one time were greater in number and might are gone forever. I'm pretty sure you never met a Hittite or an Amorite at Walmart. I'm pretty sure. You never had a Gergeshite as a neighbor. Am I right about that? Yet at one time these nations far outnumbered Israel. But the fact is they're gone forever and Israel remains. Ask yourself, why is that? And I'll tell you why. Because God said his people would never cease 
to exist and that they would be regathered, redeemed, and restored in the time of the end. Consider the 300 specific prophecies concerning the first coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, God announced the family his son would descend from. He told us the time, when, and the place where his Messiah would be born, and so much more. And every detail was literally fulfilled. You know, the mathematic prob uh, mathematic probability of just 10 of the 300 prophecies coming to pass as they did is off the charts impossible. What defies human explanation is explained by this verse, Isaiah 46.10. He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Because God is eternal, because God is omniscient, because God is omnipotent and sovereign, he's able to make known the end from the beginning because he, in fact, has planned it all. Yet there's something else we should understand about God. God is relational. And his name, Jehovah, declares him to be the self-existent one who, listen to this, reveals himself. The Lord delights in being known through his spoken and written word. And just like a father with his children, he tells his children what he's planning to do before he does it. There it is, Amos 3 and verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Did you know that more than one-fourth of the Bible was prophetic when inspired by the Holy Spirit? And much of God's pre-announced program has to do with the end times, that is, the final stages of God's program. And according to the Bible, the end time is the period the world entered following Christ's resurrection and ascension to heaven. So our entire lives have been lived in God's prophetic end game. Now for the next several months, I want to take you on a journey from the present to eternity future. And on this futuristic tour, we'll view the major events that lead to the ultimate victory of a new heaven and a new earth, when God is glorified in all of his creation. And so for our purposes this morning, here's a basic chart that highlights the time of the rapture in relation to the cross, the church age, and God's dealings with his people Israel. Now, I don't know if you can read those, the fine print or not, but you see that uh, first of all, you have the rapture of the church, and then you have a span of time between that and the actual second coming of Christ. And we believe the very next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And as we'll see in the course of our study, Israel is God's timepiece. And it's the key to understanding Bible prophecy. If we compare what God has pre-announced with what's happening in Israel, we can discern what time it is in God's program. And by the way, the uh, treaty that's being forged right now may have great prophetic significance. Now, many Bible scholars holding to the literal method of interpreting the scriptures agree that the next supernatural event in God's endgame is, as we've said, the rapture of the church. Now, let me begin by explaining what the concept of a literal rapture involves. Understand with me that like the word trinity, the term rapture never appears in our Bible. But the concept is clearly there. The English word rapture comes from the Latin word rapturo, which is equivalent to harpazo in the Greek language. Harpazo means to seize or snatch away to remove something very quickly. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, harpazo is translated caught up together. And it signifies the sudden and powerful removal from earth to heaven of all who are saved by grace 
and said to be in Christ. Now, years ago, a youth pastor I served with provided me with a, with a good illustration of Harpazo. He had a dollar bill that was con connected to a retracting gizmo by some very thin fishing line. It was almost invisible. And so Mark would sit in a booth at Halo Burger or Bill Knapps, and he'd drop the bill on a, the floor a few feet outside the booth. And then when some innocent passerby would bend over to pick it up, he'd push a little button secretly, you know. And faster than the human eye could see, the bill would vanish. And, you know, this was great entertainment for a Dutchman like Mark Pasma. But the funny part was watching the people who were sure they saw a buck lying there. Where did it go? Where did it go? The departure of Christians from earth to meet Jesus in the air will be just that sudden. I mean, this is what harpazo means. It means to seize or to snatch away, to remove something very quickly. In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, again, harpazo is translated caught up. And once again, the term signifies the sudden and dramatic removal from earth to heaven of all who are in Christ. I like to think of it as a massive airlift, a massive airlift, a rescue operation. One moment will be down here, the next moment will be up there. Now, even though some Prophecies employ figurative language to describe objects and events that are hard for us to grasp. The Bible is crystal clear in announcing the return of the Lord Jesus. Write this down somewhere. The return of Jesus Christ is spoken of or alluded to in 318 New Testament verses. Now say this with me. That's a lot. That's a lot. This means that one out of every 30 New Testament verses speaks of Christ's promise to return from heaven to earth. Once again, that's a lot. It means the teaching about Christ's return is no obscure doctrine. Instead, it's a central teaching of the Bible. And as that chart that we saw a moment ago, as it, as it indicates, Christ's return is prophesied to occur in Two stages or phases commonly distinguished as the rapture of the church and the second coming. And these two phases of his return are separated by the seven years of terrible calamity known as the Great Tribulation. Bible scholars who hold to the literal method of interpreting the scriptures agree that the next event in God's program is the rapture, the rapture of the church. And since this first phase of Christ's return is imminent, which means it could happen at any moment. Nothing needs to happen before the rapture. And in coming weeks, I'll show some of the differences between verses that speak of the rapture and verses that speak of the second coming. But this morning, I want to focus on the three main passages that present the promise of Christ's return to rapture his church. Now, just before we, we do that, did you know that the concept of rapture isn't new to the New Testament? The Bible tells us of several raptures that have already happened. Concerning Enoch, Genesis 5 and verse 24 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch is the seventh man named in the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5. It's a genealogy that begins with Adam. And following Adam, five men are named, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, and Jared. And concerning the lifespan of each man, the scripture says this, so all the days of so-and-so were such-and-such, -and, -such, and he died. After every one of those names... And this pattern is abruptly interrupted with Enoch, the seventh in the line. And verse 24 says, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. You know, because Enoch happens to be the seventh from Adam, and seven is the number of completion in the Bible, his sudden departure may prefigure 
what happens to the church. God's end game for the church. And today we're living in the 7,000 year periods ever since Adam. And the sudden airlift that happened to Enoch is prophesied to happen to us. One, one moment Enoch was walking with God on earth. The next moment he was walking with God in heaven. He just was no more. God snatched him away. And so Enoch went from earth to heaven without the services of an undertaker or a cemetery plot. Later in the Old Testament, Elijah is another man who never died but was snatched away from earth to heaven. And, and I won't take the time to read the entire passage, but we see it in 2 Kings chapter 2. And verse 11 says, Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And so just like Enoch, Elijah never died, but was snatched from earth to heaven. So, so here are several Old Testament examples of men who bypassed death and were miraculously transported into the presence of God. Now we know the risen Lord Jesus also experienced rapture at the time of his ascension. Here's what we read in Acts chapter 1. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. He was harpazoed. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So nobody should ever say, you know, the rapture can't happen because, you know, it's just never happened before. Well, it has happened before. The Bible tells us so. And what's new and unique about the rapture of the church is God's promise to rapture an enormous group of believers at one time. And you say, well, is, is this hard for God to do? Hard for God to pull off? Will the rapture test God's energy? You know, I'm thinking, no, <laughs> not at all, not at all. If the creator God can put the stars in place without working up a sweat, he can certainly transport some no stars from earth to heaven. And raptures don't end when the church is caught up to heaven. Sometime after the church is raptured, Revelation 11, verse 11 and 12 prophesies the resurrection and rapture of two faithful miracle-working witnesses who are martyred because they're faithful to Jesus. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. By the way, I want you to remember that invitation. Come up here. I'll give you a hint. The same phrase appears in chapter 4 and verse 1 of Revelation. And I believe that is our call to go up and meet the Lord in the air. So the concept of rapture isn't new, it isn't unique, it happened as far back as Enoch, it happened as recently as the Apostle Paul who was caught up to the third heaven. Now, that's my introduction. Let's begin with a passage that we read as our scripture reading this morning, and I call it the parting promise, the parting promise. John 14, 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. By the way, Sean Hannity was not the first to make up that phrase. No, he got it from Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now understand that when Jesus gave this parting promise, his disciples were completely bewildered. They were discouraged. They were fearful. Terrified wouldn't overstate their emotional state. Jesus told them he was going away. He said he would suffer and die. He told them that one of the 12 was a traitor. 
He said that Peter would disown him three times and that Satan was at work against all of them. And he said that all the disciples would desert him. Each of these predictions came to pass and they were the cause for terrible discouragement. The disciples were especially troubled to hear that Jesus, whom they had been with for three and a half years, he's about to leave. He's going to leave them. The promise recorded in John 14 was given to the disciples in the upper room the night before Jesus was crucified. And for the next 20 years, this promise, John 14, 1 to 3, this promise was the hope and the comfort that was held out to Christ's followers. And until a more detailed explanation of Christ's return was revealed to Paul and then passed on to the church, this was all the earliest believers had to go on. And would you notice the details of Christ's promise? Number, verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This promise was intended to bring comfort and peace to these troubled followers. And it applies to all who trust the, God the Son the same way they trust the faithfulness of God the Father. What Jesus promised is a message of hope and encouragement, not concern or alarm. If the next event for us to expect is the horrors of the tribulation, let me tell you, if you take the Bible literally, alarm would be appropriate. Jesus offered them comfort and hope and assurance. Notice in verse 2, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. See, heaven is like an enormous complex with a, with a suite for every believer and, and plenty of room to spare. And between his ascension and his return to receive those who trust him, Jesus is doing something. He's at work. He is preparing living accommodations in his father's house. Now, I want you to think of it this way. The creator... The master carpenter is building you a home in heaven. And you're going to love it. You're going to love it. In verse 3, Jesus promised the day when it would come when he would personally return to earth from his father's house. He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. You see, included in the promise is the fact that Jesus will return to take us to be with him where he is. Now, notice, he didn't say he will come to stay where we are. He said he will come to take us to be where he is. And finally, in verse 3, the purpose of his return is expressed in these words, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, in this simple promise, the Lord announced his end game for every born-again believer. Jesus has promised to return someday to airlift us from where we are to the place that he has prepared for us. You say, well, is this promise far out? Yeah, yeah, this is far out. Does everybody believe it? No, no. In fact, uh, sad to say, there are many evangelical churches who no longer preach it. Has it happened before? Yes, it has happened before. Will it be hard for God? No way. No way. Should this promise affect our attitudes here and now? Absolutely. Absolutely. The blessed hope that is ours in Christ should energize our lives every day. See, we are people going somewhere, you know, for us, the best is yet to come. But let's turn to a second New Testament passage. Turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I call this passage the glorious translation. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now you've heard this forever, but this is a great verse to put over the door of a nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Yeah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, 
and we shall be changed. Amen. Now the Holy Spirit inspired these words in response to some in Corinth who denied the resurrection. They said such a thing just can't happen. It can't happen. They believe the dead stay dead. But they were dead wrong. Notice that Paul called the teaching he was about to give them a mystery. The word is mysterion in the Greek. A mysterion is a sacred secret. Don't you love secrets? I love secrets. I love surprises, but I don't keep them very well. You know? A mystery in the Bible is a data point of information that was previously hidden but now revealed. And this means that up until Paul's time, the revelation of God's end game for the church was brand new. It was hot off the press. In fact, the church itself is also called a mystery that was completely unknown by the Old Testament scriptures. Now notice the details. Verse 51 explains that not every Christian will experience physical death. We shall not all sleep. And here sleep, and again in 1 Thessalonians 4, is used synonymously as a figure for death. Now, except for the snoring, a sleeping person can look like a person who has died. Isn't that right? You know, we even say he's dead asleep. He's dead asleep. What, is he dead or is he asleep? And let that be a warning to any who fall asleep in church, you know, because we just might misunderstand what's going on here and say a few words over you and bury you. <laughs> and afterwards have to say, whoops, my bad, you know. So not all Christians will experience death, but all Christians, the living and the dead, will experience change. Every true believer in Jesus will experience a total makeover. Verse 51 and 52 say our transformation will happen in an instant, will happen in the twinkling of an eye. I'm reminded of the old farmer and his, his old wife, and uh, they went into a fancy New York hotel for the very first time. They had never seen an elevator before. And, and so stepping on the elevator ahead of them was this elderly lady, sweet elderly lady, and the doors shut. They were closed for a little while. And the next time the doors opened, this beautiful young woman stepped out. And so the old farmer said, Honey, get in there! <laughs> Well, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And the Bible says it will be signaled by the sound of a trumpet. I don't know if everybody's going to hear the trumpet or just those of us who believe. We're going to hear it. And listen, the newly transformed body that will pass through whatever is overhead will be incorruptible. This means our new body won't be subject to sickness or death but will remain healthy and vigorous forever. And so God has some wonderful news for every believer. The body we always hope for is coming special delivery. <laughs> I like to say it's coming by means of UPS. I mean, we're going to get it on the way up, right? Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21 say, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. See, this end game that God has in mind for his created universe is going to start with us. The change will happen with us first. We will be glorified to be like Jesus. And then seven or so years later, the entire creation will be glorified as God takes control of it once again. So let's put together what we know so far. The encouraging news that God has given us is that Jesus is coming to snatch us away. And, and he's going to snatch us away to the living accommodations that he's prepared for us in heaven. The rapture is signaled by the blast of a trumpet. It will happen in the twinkling of an eye. No advance notice. And don't let this particular trumpet blast confuse you with other trumpet blasts that are mentioned in Revelation. Trumpets were commonly blown in Israel for all sorts of events. And there's a number of trumpet blasts in the book of Revelation. This is the one that calls us home. 
Here we're told that both the dead and the living will undergo instantaneous transformation, which will equip us with bodies that are imperishable and like the body of the risen and glorified Jesus. This is good news. Now, as we finish, the third passage is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's a little bit longer. Let me read it. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, like the situation in Corinth, the Holy Spirit gave this new revelation to Paul, who wrote it in a letter addressed to the believers at Thessalonica. And it was given to correct some wrong ideas and to encourage a church that was grieving for some fellow believers who had died before Jesus came back. They weren't sure what happened to those who died before the rapture took place. And according to verse 13, what we find here is hope-filled information for believers, about believers who have already died. And once again, to be asleep is a metaphor for death. Notice that verse 14 tells us that the promise made here is based on on the fact of Christ's resurrection. In other words, this event is just as certain to happen as the resurrection of Jesus happened, which some have called the best attested fact of history. As Paul said in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the Lord's end game includes those who sleep in Jesus, who are also referred to as the dead in Christ. And as a matter of fact, the dead in Christ will be raised before believers who are alive when all this takes place, when Jesus returns. Verse 14 and 15, the dead in Christ will rise first. So what's the plan? Well, verse 16 says that Jesus will descend. He will come down from heaven to the atmosphere above the earth. The souls of believers who already died will come with him. And by the way, this should come as no surprise because 2 Corinthians 5 teaches that the souls of believers who die go instantly to be with the Lord. Our believing loved ones who died are conscious and they are safe in heaven already. Verse 16 goes on to say that this promised event will be signaled by the archangel's loud command, and here it is again, a trumpet blast. The bodies of believers who died before this event will be the first to rise. In other words, a a resurrection will take place. And by means of resurrection, the souls of Christians who died will be given glorified bodies. Verse 17 promises that every believer who is alive when this takes place will then be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And what a day that will be. What a day that will be. After this event, and resulting from this event, verse 18 says, we will be with the Lord forever. Wherever Jesus goes, we go with him. And finally, notice the end of verse 18. This promise was given to bring comfort in the face of dying, death, and and all of life's troubles. So let me wrap this up. The New Testament reveals a sacred secret about God's end game that's found nowhere else in the Bible. Nowhere else in the Bible. At the present time, Jesus is preparing living accommodations in his Father's house in heaven for all who trust him. And as a source of hope and comfort, he promised that he would return suddenly 
to take believers to be with him forever. By an act of divine power signaled only by a loud command, which I think is going to be come up here, and a trumpet blast, the Lord will resurrect all the dead in Christ and will snatch away all those in Christ who are alive at this time. Both the living and the dead will instantly experience transformation to an incorruptible and glorified state that is necessary, it is essential for life in the presence of God. Both the living and the dead will meet the Lord in the atmosphere above the earth, and from there we will ascend to our heavenly home. And once the rapture takes place, and we're united with the Lord Jesus in glorified bodies, we will never again be separated from him. Remember what I said at the start? I said the primary objective of end game is checkmate. When one player maneuvers his opponent's king into a check from which it cannot escape. Maybe, I'm just throwing this out, maybe this is a way to describe what happened at Calvary. Satan thought he could end the game by enticing men to crucify the Son of God. And for three days and nights he thought he had won. Oh, but Satan, as he always does, overstepped himself. And by the death of Jesus on the cross, Satan, who is called the prince of this world, was lured into a check from which he cannot escape. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him, who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. God's end game for the church is to save us from the wrath that we deserved because of sin. Romans 5 and verse 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Did you look at that phrase, saved from wrath? Do you know that wrath is the key word that describes what happens next in God's end game, the great tribulation? It's the key word describing that period of time. From before creation, God planned to destroy the devil's power. He planned to release us from sin's bondage. And why did he do that? There's only one explanation in all of scripture, because he loves us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so according to God's plan, Jesus went to the cross in our place. The perfect man, the man who never sinned, became our substitute. For a brief moment, Satan thought he had won. Oh, but God had another move. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. So heaven's king is not in check. He is alive. And by means of his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus destroyed Satan's power and set us free from bondage to the fear of death. You know, here's the good news. Here's the good news. The victory has already been won for those who trust him. The victory has already been won for those who trust him. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. You know, as an old fellow once said, having heard a message like this, he said, all that's left is the shouting. All that's left is the shouting. The victory has been won. Let's bow our heads and our hearts, and then Sam's going to come and lead us in sing, singing victory in Jesus. Father, we're so thankful for your word and for the way it serves as an anchor for our souls. Uh, we, we are not those who sorrow without hope. 
We are not those who are confused about what's happening in the world. We're not among those who are uncertain about what the future holds because we know who holds the future. We know you. And we know the plan that you have pre-announced and revealed to us by your Spirit. And so I pray, Father, that we would be doing those things that are pleasing to you until that moment when Jesus calls, calls us home. Help us to be waiting productively. Help us to be witnessing energetically. Help us, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be until he comes, for we ask in his precious name.